Hello everyone. It's a huge pleasure to be able to speak at a FIGS event. This is because there are very few organizations that speak to the general public. Learned professional societies tend to have meetings that speak to their own, whereas FIGS events organizes itself to be able to convey messages from the science, engineering, and technology community to the wider audiences who also have a stake in the issues that are being addressed. This is why when Figs asked me to speak about a particular passion of mine, which is the oceans, I was very happy to accept. Tonight I've chosen to address the deep sea mining industry. This is because it is an emerging marine industry in the uh, world today, which is trying, to its eternal credit, to try to get it right without engaging in environmentally destructive practices to make sure that what they do produce is environmentally and commercially sustainable and to engage the entire world in the responsible development of these important resources that are necessary to maintain the technology and the growth in the technology that we are looking for today and are all deeply wedded to in our daily activities. One of the great fascinations of the deep sea mining industry is that it in fact challenges all the marine disciplines that we have available to us. It also challenges all the regulatory and advisory groups that contribute to the responsible development of a new resource. And because it is new, because it is trying to be innovative, I hope that tonight's lecture will provide examples for other emerging marine industries to uh, take a similarly constructive path as they work with the world's oceans. FIGS events, their technical lectures are really special. I've had the joy of knowing Fiona and Christine for a long time and they're like the proverbial swans gliding along and you don't actually get a feeling of just the enormous amount of work that goes into planning something like this. But they are specialists at that, at getting people together, uh, as far as the lectures are concerned, getting people of different qualities, different calibres along to listen to something that is not necessarily natural to them. It's a tremendous skill and they have done an incredible job. There have been two previous ones, one that introduced us to engineering failures and what can be done as a result of those. The other, described as spellbinding by some of the audience, was on fibre optic sensors and their use in industry. Now, something totally different, something really exciting, deep sea mining. Dr. Philomene Verlan is going to introduce us to the marvellous world of manganese nodules, of cobalt crusts, polymetallic sulphides, and how on earth we get them mined. It's really going to be a fantastic evening and certainly defines what FIGS Events is all about. Getting like-minded people together to listen, to discuss, to debate, and end up supremely happy and having learned a great deal. And of course, it includes networking. And that's what we're here this evening to do.
Uh, Fiona, thank you very much, and Christine, the two directors of FIGS, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight on my very favorite topic, as some of you know, which is deep sea mining. The variety of disciplines that deep sea mining challenges and also incorporates and embraces are such that this will be a whirlwind taster tour of what the industry has to offer. And it is also, for all of you who think, oh my god, it's going to be only biology, or it's going to be only engineering, or god help me, it's going to be only law, it won't be. It'll be a little bit of everything, so that all of you can enjoy within your own specialty a little bit of what deep sea mining has to offer, but also see what the other disciplines have to offer. And throughout this talk, please bear in mind that deep sea mining can inform other emerging marine industries, but it can also inform our legacy industries that are active out in the oceans in the many ways that it has to offer on how to engage in commercially and environmentally responsible behavior in developing the resources of the deep sea and of the oceans in general, which after all cover 70% more or less of our planet, but govern the health of the planet completely. So in this context, if you bear this in mind, I will now start on my whirlwind tour of deep sea mining. This, this is an overview of the various topics I will touch on in this talk. Thank you, Ian. We're going to start with the resources. And I want to emphasize that I'm only going to talk about these three hard mineral resources. I will not be looking at some of the other mineral resources that you will have been hearing about recently, including phosphorites and uh, methane hydrates and um, the polymetallic brines. We're going to look at these three because they are uh, receiving the most detailed attention right now in the international community, and at least two of them are quite close to being uh, uh, exploited. The major point that you want to bear in mind is that these three resources from this slide and from what I will be saying further on should not be treated as fungible items in terms of regulatory activity. They come from three very different environments, they're very different deposits, and they have therefore very, very different consequences from a regulatory and an environmental point of view, which needs to be borne in mind as you think about what I say uh, in the course of this lecture. The abyssal sediments that host the ferromanganese nodules are exactly what they say on the tin. They are soft, but they vary in their softness. They vary in their liquid content. And these will have, just by that virtue alone, entirely different consequences, both in terms of the technical challenges deriving from their um, mining, but also, again, in terms of the environmental consequences related to their extraction. In contrast, you have the cobalt-rich ferromanganese crusts, which are deposits that form on the flanks of seamounts. You can think of them literally as a crust that form on a very, very hard substrate, whereas the nodules can be, are potato-shaped and can be hoovered up from the sediments. The crusts need to be literally cut off the side of the seamount and preferably keeping as much of the seamount in place as possible because that has no value, whereas the crusts do. The polymetallic sulfides are the ones, are the only ones in this lecture that I will discuss that are uh, hydrothermally influenced and they are the ones that you will remember from all of the wonderful vent pictures that you, uh, that you have seen in the, uh, in the uh, scientific literature and on the web. 
and they are again very, very interesting because they're the ones that are also associated with seismic activity, which presents very different technical challenges of its own. So these are the three I will be talking about, and bear in mind that they are three different resources from three different environments. Here's just a view of a manganese nodule field. This is a particularly prospective one. In other words, there's lots of manganese nodules in there. One of the things that you want to also remember is that um, manganese nodules are very, very variable, even over very, very small distances in terms of their um, presence on the seabed. And this is a major technical challenge in trying to determine the extent of the nodules. And also, they vary quite um, profoundly in their metal content over quite short distances. So again, if you're looking at this from a commercial point of view and a technical point of view, trying to discover the extent of the nodules and their metal grade is really quite challenging. Um, this is a nodule. You can, see, you can see they're potato shaped, they're pretty much like this. They're found in the upper five to 10 centimeters of the abyssal sediments. They grow extremely slowly. These are not a renewable resource. <coughs> the uh, other element that is environmentally very important that you want to start bearing in mind when you think about the rest of this talk in this context is that there are very probably Cecil communities associated with the nodules themselves that need the nodules to grow on. In other words, whether they need the nodules per se is not clear. We don't know that yet, but they need a hard substrate. In general, hard substrate are at a premium in the deep sea. The deep sea has a lot more sediment than it does hard substrata, and there are organisms that are specialized to live only on hard substrates and not in the sediments and vice versa. So bear this in mind when you think about the environmental consequences that I will discuss later on. The reason I, this is up here is that the most prospective and the most heavily researched area in the world for nodules is in the clarion clipperton zone. These are two fracture zones, as you can see, in the uh, eastern part of the, um, of the North Pacific. The uh, eponymous um, zones are the source of the name. And where you want to have a look, it's a very large area, is that this particular area, and you want to bear this in mind, these six uh, million square kilometers, more or less, I've seen estimates that it goes up to nine million square kilometers, is going to be the area where it is most likely that deep sea mining for nodules will take place sooner rather than later now, in large part because of the entry into the field in the last few years of um, private companies into the nodule research and development area. This is an area beyond national jurisdiction. This is another element that you want to bear in mind as you listen to my lecture through the, um, through the remainder of this talk. The areas beyond national jurisdiction are areas beyond the exclusive economic zone and the outer continental shelf of coastal states. The Law of the Sea Convention assigns the authority for dealing with <coughs> mining in these areas to the International Seabed Authority. And in the clarion Clipperton zone, this has already been divided up, as you can see, amongst a number of countries. I will go into this in more detail when we get into the regulatory side of this lecture. What you would need to take away from this slide is just already start thinking about the environmental management problems of the International Seabed Authority dealing with upwards of 20 countries in an area that is 6 million square kilometers for which you need to be able to deal with not only the regional consequences of the mining, which when you also bear in mind that going from east to west and from north to south, the distance is already sufficiently big that you have very, very different environmental 
conditions, starting in the east and going to the west, and also between north and south. So you will have, for example, very different sediment situations here than you do over here. Um, just as, a, just as a, uh, one example, the productivity, the overlying productivity at this side of the clarion Clipperton zone is much lower than at that side, which means that there is more food available down here to the organisms than there is there, and there are other consequences. So you have, if you are looking at this from a regulatory point of view, you have an extremely large and complicated set of environmental variables to deal with and a large and complicated set of individual contracting parties that have mining interests here. You also want to be aware of these other green areas here. These are areas of particular environmental interest that um, are going to be used as reference zones for the uh, setting of baselines against which within the mining areas the um, effects of mining we hope will be able to be compared. Within each mining area, by the way, and most of the concessions, just to give you an idea, are about between 75,000 and 100,000 square kilometers as well for each of the concessions. So you're also looking at um, seriously large areas within the clarion Clipperton zone assigned to the various contractors. S within those mining areas as well, there will need to be preservation zones and impact zones set aside to also engage in um, the more localized mining comparative activities. And this is just to give you a flavor, again, of the scale and the complexity of the environmental and regulatory challenges that are faced by the International Seabed Authority in managing this. Now, now to go to the next resource, ferromanganese crusts. I said that they formed on, on uh, the flanks of seamounts, and these need to be quite old seamounts because crusts as well, um, I do need to get this right, crusts as well form very, very slowly. They form even more slowly than the manganese nodules because they do not have, usually, uh, they are not sediment hosted, so they do not have a diagenetic component in the sediment, which does help increase the speed at which nodules form. Crusts form purely by precipitation out of the overlying seawater. And as you can see, this is even slower than the, uh, than the manganese nodules. Again, this is absolutely not a non-renewable resource. And remember when I told you before that part of the big challenge with manganese crusts is to get this part and not this part when you're mining it. The technology for how to do that is, is very, very much in its infancy. And this is one of the major technical challenges that is um, keeping manganese crusts from being exploited anytime soon. The other problem with manganese crusts is, let me just go back one, um, you can see that there are little patches of sediment, even though the seamounts need to be sediment free for manganese crust to form, sediments will drift in and out, and there are large areas on seamounts which are currently sediment covered that may have crusts underneath, and trying to figure out when you're doing a resource assessment on how much of the seamount actually has useful manganese crusts underneath the sediment. Again, the technology is not quite there yet to do that in an efficient way. So there is another technical challenge facing the, um, the manganese crust situation. This just gives you a very brief overview of um, the sorts of areas from a global perspective in the ocean that uh, are covered by these mineral resources for these metals and in comparison with the land-based uh, resources. As you can see, in the oceans it is quite extensive what there is available in terms of area for deep sea mining. 
Now, I mentioned to you that the International Seabed Authority is dealing with many, with, is dealing with other areas in the clarion Clipperton zone. They are dealing, in fact, with resources for both crusts and sulfides in other oceans. This is the, uh, the North Pacific, where we have um, China, Japan, and the Russian Federation who are looking at, uh, who are looking at crusts on these various seamounts. We have also Brazil, who is looking at crusts in the uh, South Atlantic. You have, um, again, here a feeling for, just to give you a feeling for the uh, types of resources that um, the crusts and the nodules make available. We can pretty much deal with uh, all of the world's requirements for these metals from the deep sea. And it is therefore going to be a, uh, a very, very useful source for us. However, we need to make sure that it is done in a commercially and environmentally responsible way. And one of the areas that is most encouraging about this particular industry, as you will see later on, is they really are trying to do this right at the beginning and to make sure that the environment is not affected as much as um, it might otherwise be if we did not have such responsible people having uh, an interest in this. And this is in very large part, this is not in, in any way um, due to them necessarily feeling that the, uh, the environment in and of itself is, um, is, uh, is a major issue. This is commercially also extremely important. And, uh, and this is what I will come to later on. If you re mine responsibly from the beginning, you will have fewer costs at the end. And this is in very large part because in the deep sea, you basically can't fix it. Once these substrata are gone, once the sedimentation is spread all over the, uh, the area to be, to be mined, remediation is virtually impossible. So it's probably better, and this is a major technical challenge, which when I give this talk to marine engineers, has them all literally licking their chops and getting out the envelopes and doing the designs is to design the mining equipment so that the impact of the mining is already as low as possible. Right, so, and now we're going to come to the third of the three, and these are the uh, polymetallic sulfides. These are probably the most photogenic of the lot. You've all seen them blowing their great plumes into the water column, and the chimneys can grow very, very rapidly. However, this is not, again, a renewable resource. The uh, chimneys themselves can grow very quickly, but the really interesting resource is in the ore body underneath. What you want to think of is the chimneys are the flags that tell the prospectors if there is a chimney there, there is likely to be an ore body underneath. So the um, polymetallic sulfides, here is, another, here is another image just to show you why they're called black smokers. Uh, the uh, color varies depending on the, uh, in, in very large part, on the, on the temperature of the, uh, of the flow that comes out and the types of minerals that, is being, uh, that are being emitted. But one of the very interesting ways, and again, it's another technical challenge of trying to find where these are in the deep sea, is to follow, you can have very, very sensitive uh, water column sensing equipment now, which can detect anomalies in the water column way upstream, and you follow them downstream to the smoker. And one of the very interesting uh, technical developments is to try to get these particular um, indications for inactive vents because another one of the technical challenges of doing prospecting in and around this sort of area is that you really are looking at a difference of 400 degrees C right here 
and maybe two to four degrees C right here, and your technology is much happier at four degrees C than it is at 400 degrees C. Uh, with, uh, with Nautilus, I have heard the, uh, the, the company that is looking at um, mining polymetallic sulfides within the EEZ of Papua New Guinea, that when they were doing some of their prospecting, they were actually drilling on what they thought was an inactive vent. And that actual drilling activity started the, um, the venting again, which was interesting because their equipment was by no means um, capable of dealing with what turned out to be 350 degrees C uh, water that was being emitted. As you might think, um, because they are hydrothermally oriented, the sulfides are associated with the seismically active areas in the, uh, in the world. They tend to be on either mid-ocean spreading ridges or on the subduction zones. And those of you are familiar with the ring of top fire concept, though that is the subduction zone around the Pacific where we have quite a number of um, prospectively interesting for the metal content hydrothermal vents, which could also have interesting ore bodies associated <laughs> with them for mining. Here again is an area in, uh, in the uh, Indian Ocean where the, uh, is that the Indian Ocean? Yes. No, it's the Atlantic, sorry, I don't have my glasses on. The, um, the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is being looked at for sulfides, both by France and by Russia. And one of the reasons I'm putting this in not only is to show you that the International Seabed Authority, bless his heart, has to deal in all three oceans with a very tiny secretariat in Jamaica, but that we are here in Northern Europe, we have some interesting activity going on right off our shores in the, uh, in the North Atlantic with, uh, with these two countries. And finally, um, another area that we are looking at, and this is for sure the Indian Ocean, um, is uh, the India, who is the only country not represented in the clarion Clipperton zone, and this is because they have lots of nodules in the central Indian Ocean basin on which they are focusing. However, in there as well, um, China and Germany are both now um, also contractors in this area. Again, this is all outside the EEZ. This is all still within the remit of the International Seabed Authority, and they're looking at sulfides in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean. So you see, we're looking at all three resources in all three oceans in a uh, very, very challenging marine environment, because you can see in all of them, and as you will recall from the locations I've shown you before, other than possibly the mid-Atlantic, they're all actually very, very far from the nearest land as well, which has its own technical challenges in terms of designing mining systems that can function out there that are not going to be that easily reached by, uh, totally not reachable by helicopter, for example, or even by support vessels with any, uh, with any, uh, uh, frequency or regularity. And finally, remember, this is also going to affect the equipment that you use. This is going to have to be extremely reliable, able to work at very deep depths, and you're going to need to be aware that they're not going to be able to be fixed very easily if anything goes wrong. So right now, this is um, probably going to be a little bit underestimating now. I think for exploration, we have um, nearly 2 million square kilometers under contract. But this gives you an idea of where they all are. Again, in all the oceans, way out to sea, both north and south of the equator in many respects. So you have very different environmental circumstances and climatic circumstances also to deal with. Why are we doing this? We have, right now, it's never a good idea to put all your eggs in one basket. And right now, we have China, which produces 30 of these metals. And the ore grades are declining rapidly in land-based deposits. And what we really need is to start diversifying the sources for these metals 
um, because also in China they're uh, losing a lot of their, um, their, or they're depleting a lot of their resources as we saw a couple of years ago where they felt that they were exporting way too many of their rare earths and decided to um, put a stop to that and keep them for their own consumption and quite rightly. And meanwhile, however, this did mean that the rest of the world, which had happily closed its rare, its rare earths mines, um, thinking, oh well, you know, we can't compete, all of a sudden found that they had a resource issue. Um, the, the, I'm just giving China as an example. There are other reasons why you want to uh, diversify your sources of metals. And this is one of, the, one of the drivers, one of the principal drivers for the deep sea mining industry. Our, our resources, as you saw in the first slide, the three that I'm focusing on, do cover just about all the critical metals that we do need for our technology to which we are all wedded and are becoming increasingly wedded as time goes on and which we need for just about every single application that um, I can think of at this point, we need more and more and more of them and we need them to be uh, available in as environmentally responsible a way as possible, which again, I cannot emphasize strongly enough is one of the key drivers that is going to underpin whether or not this um, industry is going to be commercially viable at all. Because the um, rules that govern their extraction, at least in areas beyond national jurisdiction, are very heavily driven by the um, environmental requirements which are set under international law. Just to give you, um, again, the um, background to the statement that I just made that the uh, resources um, are absolutely key, but also a source for all of the metals that we will be needing. As we learn more about their resources, even in the side where it says longer term potential, that can pretty much now be translated with what we've discovered in the last five or so years, these um, L's can pretty much all turn into G's. So it is really very, very important that um, we get it right when we start going after them seriously in the deep sea. I'm now going to turn to much more of an engineering side. Here we have the overview of the mining cycle, which looks deceptively simple, exploration, exploitation, and closure. What you, what you want to bear in mind from this slide is that what we have here is a particularly interesting combination of the use of existing technology, which is then being rejigged to be able to deal with the particular requirements. This is why the creative adaptation is what is intriguing everyone that um, is looking at this area now in terms, for example, either of changing their careers or reorienting their careers, or in the case of students deciding on new careers, how to get at these minerals in a commercially and environmentally viable way. And we need all the skills. We need absolutely all of them. There is not a single marine discipline that I can think of right now that does not need to be called upon in order to do this mining in the right way. And by the way, there are several of you in here that I know are in the regulatory and advisory capacity. The lawyers amongst us here, and I'm one of those as well, this has been, this has been absolutely essential for the um, mining industry in order to obtain the regulatory regime under which it is operating. It needs the input as well from regulators and advisors that have enough of a feel for the EST requirements to be able to discuss with their colleagues and to know where to go to get additional specialist information so that when all those regulations are put together and you're out there mining in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you're dealing with a regulation that will work in a Force 10 gale and that is also comprehensible to the people that are actually out there on the ships trying to um, get these resources up off the ocean floor and onto the vessel. So this ongoing 
conversation between all of these disciplines are essential for deep sea mining to be a success. And this is not only true for deep sea mining. It is true for all the industries that operate in the deep sea. But I have right now in my experience not so far, and it's been about 30 years that I've been looking at this subject, seen this type of conversation go on so intensely in any of the other um, areas that I have looked at in terms of the development of marine resources. So this is hugely, hugely exciting, and it is essential for this to be a success. Just going to give you a little bit of a feel for the various inspirations from the existing industries out there. We have uh, we have from the we have dredgers we've got oil and gas we've got we've got uh, the cable people all of them have input to give to this uh, to this uh, industry and this gives you just a visual idea of what we're of what we're looking at here in terms of the way the technology is being uh, is being developed as I told you at the beginning, this, these are not fungible items from a regulatory point of view. These are the three major areas where we have the technical challenges, the deposit themselves, the environment, and the environmental requirements, which, as you recall, varies depending on the environment of the resource itself. And that, again, even though you think, well, all right, the clarion Clipperton zone, for example, it's in the North Pacific, just because it's so big from east to west, you will have different requirements depending on where you are, even within your own mining, with a particular mining area. The basic mining concept is the same for all four, uh, for all three, and it can be broken down into four different mining components. Here you have a visualization for how Nautilus sees its, um, its uh, mining going on, which illustrates the four, the four components. You've got the production support vessel. You've got the riser system. On the production support vessel, you have to put in that fourth component, which is where the ore processing takes place. There will be minimal ore processing. It'll be just enough to get the ore into a condition where it can be transported to land for further processing. The best information that I've been able to get is that it is not now considered commercially viable to do any further ore processing at sea. And then you have the mining tools, which again is what has certainly my marine engineers really, really salivating um, at the uh, thought of designing these guys um, to, and this is just for, this is just for, um, for the sulfides. So, which is the closest, by the way, to the traditional terrestrial mining concept because there you're really dealing with getting big, heavy chunks of ore body out of the seabed. So you need to first prepare the, uh, the, the, the seabed, and then you need to have something that can go over the prepared seabed and actually chop up the bits of ore body, turn it into a type of slurry. It'll be hoovered up through there, and then that slurry needs to go up the riser, into the mining support vessel. That system is the same for the other two. Here we have a nodule one. Now with the nodules, what you have is the problem that what you want are nodules and what you don't want is sediment. And what you also want, and this is something you want to be aware of for all three of the systems, is that you want this to be enclosed, the riser system, so that you can minimize the environmental, potential environmental consequences of sediments coming up or being released in the progress up to the, up to the vessel. Sedimentation is a major problem, as I will get into. So, and then here we have the seabed collector, which is the one that, um, again, there are several different designs out there, and they're mostly proprietary. So I can only give you um, what is available, is available publicly. But this enables you to visualize what we're looking at. And then for those of you that are um, really 
uh, thinking of the aspects of how do we power all of this. All of this is, needs to be powered from the vessel. So I'm not sure we have any naval architects in this group. Um, but again, the marine engineers, just think of supplying all this power to um, this particular uh, device for a year. You know, it, this, is, this is again a whole area of design where people are, are yeah. wondering how they can design the vessel, how they can design the power systems. These are major engineering challenges that um, are very, very exciting to, uh, to uh, be looking at just from a purely technical point of view. For exploration, um, we need to first find them, all these resources, and again, because the three environments are so different, you will need to look at different types of exploration technology and different types of um, results from this technology in order to be able to determine where these, not, where these resources are and whether they are worth prospecting. This gives you an outline of the various areas that you need to uh, look at. Even if you've discovered that it's a really good resource, topography is a huge problem here. Because you saw already the, uh, the uh, two Nautilus designs. You can't operate machinery this complex on too much of a slope. So you have to already be aware that even in the abyssal plain, so-called, there are hills. And this is one area as well which is going to make it very, very interesting to determine how much, even if you've discovered a nodule resource, how much of it you can actually mine, which again has its own environmental consequences to think about. And just to give you an idea of the variety of exploration tools that are all required, um, in looking at this, there's not really a single one that you can, that you can really exclude because you, first, first of all, it is essential that you've got GPS for all the positioning. It's essential that you know how deep things are. It's essential that you ground truth everything, that you actually put down some type of physical sampler to see what, um, the, what is actually down there and compared with what you're uh, looking at in terms of your data from, uh, from other instruments. Here's another, here's another example. All of this was hanging off this machine. Well, I know I was going to talk about phosphorites, but this picture was just too good to not, to not show. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find one that showed all, the, all this instrumentation for any of the resources that I am talking about. So here we are. This is, uh, this is again, from a technology point of view now, something that you want to be really, really aware of, that uh, the, the interpretation of all of these various data inputs is a dark art in and of itself. And technologists that are able to do this and come up with credible results that are then borne out when you have um, the samplers and the dredges and bringing it up, that is a very, very specialized and can be highly lucrative career to be able to do this. And to give you just a vague idea, when you're looking at backscatter, look at all of this. This is one of the particular forms of um, acoustic information that you get, which then has to be translated from all of this grayness into this sort of work. And then what you see usually in the magazines, you know, the beautiful pictures with the, with the colors and the different topography type and bathymetric type delineations, all of this starts with stuff like this or stuff like that. And I have to say uh, at this point that it gives a whole different meaning to Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. And <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, uh, point, however, I want to leave you with that is just because you have technology doesn't mean you actually immediately get usable data. There are a whole lot of steps in between the technology and their deployment and what you can actually um, do at the very end. By this, by the way, as I promised in the previous slide, here's where the credits are. And thank you to everyone who provided these wonderful pictures for this particular lecture through the um, through their various websites. 
And now exploitation. Exploitation, again, this is where you bring it up, put it on the ship, and take it to land and start selling it. The, again, each one has their separate technical challenges. I have just selected um, one for each in order to keep it simple. For, and I have, I believe, referred to these already uh, a little bit in leading up to this particular slide. For um, the sulfides, just getting the ore body up. For nodules, mega nodules, micro sediment. And for crust, just getting the crust off that seamount without taking most, most of the seamount with you. Now, for all three, the technical challenges, as I said, is, um, are, are more comparable. The transfer has the same, the same issues. The ore dewatering and then disposal, in particular, of the water and the fines is um, a technical challenge which we are trying uh, to do in a way which doesn't have them go over the side, which unfortunately most of the designs right now, at least in the nodule context and in the sulfide context, has the water and the fines. Um, in the sulfide context, a bit less. I think Nautilus has developed a system where they can keep the fines and use them for other things, which would be A, environmentally responsible, and B, also commercially very interesting because the fines do have value. But the disposal of the water is, is a problem, and um, I've been encouraging uh, the engineers and the people that I discuss with to try to figure out a way to not put the water back over the side. Um, however, there we are. This just gives you a little feel for the sorts of, and this is already um, about, this is, this is about five years old, this particular assessment by David Hayden, the former CEO of Nautilus. But just to, just to give you an idea of the sorts of power that's required for the sulfide miner, for the, and the sorts of quantities that they're looking at bringing up in a year of mining, um, the sorts of pumping requirements, just to give you a little bit of a ballpark feeling for, for what we're looking at. These are not trivial quantities. They're not going to be um, uh, employed over short periods of time, and they are going to um, require a great deal of engineering to be very, very reliable from the word, from the very beginning. Here's just an, our very own, well, it used to be our very own soil machine dynamics. They were bought by the Chinese last year. But um, here is a picture of the, um, of the auxiliary cutter, which is what is going to be actually cutting the mine, the, mine, uh, the mine body, the ore body of the polymetallic sulfides. And here is the bulk cutter, which will be preparing the, um, the ground for the, uh, for the auxiliary cutter to work with. And just to give you an idea of scale, that is a person. And so think about, again, in terms of the vessel design, when you're looking at the mining support vessel, all of this has got to be taken out to sea and deployed. This is um, going to be a challenge in and of itself. And then if something goes wrong, it has to be undeployed. So this is also uh, a challenge in and of itself. We're getting to the mining support vessel now. The efficient deck design, it has to be a stable platform. It has to, that helipad is there because this is uh, a Nautilus concept. Um, because Nautilus is going to probably do their sulfide mining within the EEZ of PNG. Uh, which is much closer to shore than any of the um, nodule mining projects that are currently on the card. Certainly nobody in the CCZ is going to be close enough to shore to have the luxury of a helipad. So you want to think of this mining support vessel being able to support um, crews for up to a year. Uh, it also has to be stable enough and big enough to accommodate a variety of specialized cranes, winches, all sorts of um, cabling actually on deck, possibly a moon pool. Uh, this, is, this is really, really interesting. My naval architects are very, very happy with uh, all the challenges that this presents them with. And uh, Nautilus, in fact, has commissioned a vessel, um, a mining vessel, at, uh, in November 2014. And that's supposed to be um, ready, we think, in 2017. So we're looking forward to seeing that. Um, in terms of further ideas when it finally rolls off the, uh, the uh, supports. 
Here is a very prototype nodule collector by um, uh, a lovely German company who um, is, uh, this is the best I could, I could get from Akerwicht, but this gives you again a feeling for what they're thinking of, uh, what they're thinking of doing. Just bear in mind, just look at this picture, you see how there's lots of nodules here and how there's no nodules there? This is an environmental problem. Um, and this is uh, something that we're also thinking of looking at just in terms of designing the actual mining system where you might not wish to be quite so very efficient in hoovering up every single nodule, but maybe, and we're looking at also designing the machines to be um, this sensitive, that you do the mining and possibly a zebra pattern, where you have nodules that are hoovered up here, but no nodules that are hoovered up there. This is, again, the type of example of the sort of let's try to get it right to begin with rather than trying to remedy this after all the nodules are gone. If you can already do it first, it will just be a lot easier environmentally to, um, to, deal, with the, uh, to deal with the environmental consequences afterwards. So here is a nodule harvest service vessel which is kindly provided to me by uh, Keppel and Keppel is an IMRS marine partner, and Keppel is the, um, as you will see later on, is um, the uh, company who uh, owns Ocean Minerals Singapore, which has a nodule concession sponsored by Singapore in the Clarion Clipperton zone. So this is what Keppel is thinking of very uh, um, abstractly in terms of what their nodule vessel might, uh, might look, at, look like. We have here a prototype crust miner. Um, John Halkyard has been in the business for at least 45 years, if not longer, and all the most contemporary designs are proprietary, but this gives you an idea. Here's a blow up of, of what, what um, Halkyard was looking at, of the sort of thing that we're looking at if we're dealing with, if we're dealing with seamounts. Very, very complex and steep topography. This needs to be a lot more flexible in the way that it operates it, with, its, with, its various, uh, with its various legs just to be able to accommodate what there's simply going to be very, very little in terms of flat surface. This is just to, to give you an idea that um, uh, of, of the sort of problem that crusts are going to present and the sort of design that has been looked at to try to address it. And then we've got mine closure. Now, the, it is required under international law to look at the um, results of the mining even after mining has stopped. And this is a major commercial consideration as well because on land you can pretty much close the mine and walk away. Monitoring is required after the mine closes at sea. And monitoring at sea is, A, as you know, very expensive. We don't actually have very well-developed technology for doing this. And uh, number three, part of the problem with monitoring at sea after mine closure in the deep sea is the fact that it will need to take a very long time. And this is because biological processes in the deep sea are so very, very slow. It, if there is going to be any regeneration at all, um, it will take at least 10 years to even be able to be discerned, if then. So 10 years of monitoring, once your mine has stopped and you don't have any metals anymore from it, this is a major commercial consideration. So you need to bear all of this in mind when you are um, a company thinking of how best to design your mining system. And one of the ways to deal with this is to try to have fewer environmental consequences that need to be looked at afterwards. Here is a very um, brief list of the, it's, brief, it's comprehensive in that it covers just about everything, but it's brief in the sense that it's in, in form of sound bites of the environmental issues we're looking at with the two top ones being the most important because they're the ones that are most likely to not be remediable. And these are the ones where good design up front can probably deal with a lot of the problems. This gives you a visualization 
of what we're looking at, which I thought would be useful because you're looking at, again, in, at three levels, at the sea floor, in the water column, and at the surface. All of these areas are um, quite, uh, quite different and have different environmental challenges, which can, we hope, in many respects be, uh, be met by good upfront planning. This just gives you a proper example from the actual deep sea of, remember the Akubirt picture, of what actually went on? This was um, taken, this picture was taken in uh, 2004, and the mine site was uh, 20 years earlier, and so you see they don't have any, any um, evidence at all of any organisms returning in the area where the nodules um, were removed. So, however, there are environmental advantages. And um, here is the list. Uh, and they are quite considerable when you put them all together, particularly when you compare them with the fact that um, the, uh, not only are the ore grades on land um, declining enormously, but Usually the mine sites are in areas where not only do you disrupt local populations, but you tend to have to go through um, major rainforests to actually get to them, or through other environmentally sensitive areas to actually get through them by building roads, etc. And the infrastructure stays. At sea, you move the ship. There is, there is, there are ways to take these advantages and um, turn them into uh, environmentally much more um, constructive uh, approaches to deep sea mining than is usually um, considered when you when you think about it. Now, the resource regulatory context. All you lawyers can um, really now sit up and take notice. What I want to um, want to emphasize here is that we're looking at uh, an industry that is governed by the law of the sea convention, and what. I want you to please remember when you leave today is that that is the instrument that governs not only mining in the deep sea, but because of the way it is set up, it provides the minimum set of environmental requirements that the countries that even wish to mine within their EEZs need to follow. And that is very, very important to bear in mind because the activities in particular of the International Seabed Authority, which is the implementing agency for this convention, are, in terms of their regulatory structures, are legally, are legally binding and because of the Law of the Sea Convention's operative provisions in this context, countries that want to mine within their um, EEZ need to follow those rules as well. What is really important, however, and this is something that is particularly vital in the context of the discussions going on in, at the United Nations in New York, is that the uh, Law of the Sea Convention and the International Seabed Authority can only deal with minerals. They cannot deal, for example, with marine genetic resources. And this is a big problem. And just to put it in a very... Um, uh, Stark context, if you happen to find a sea cucumber in a nodule field that has wonderful anti-cancer properties, and you want to go in there and go after that sea cucumber, there is absolutely nothing, either the International Seabed Authority or the contract holder that has been given a contract to mine minerals in that um, area can actually do about it under the law as it stands right now. And this is um, a particularly interesting um, driver for the uh, discussions going on in New York, which are looking to amend the Law of the Sea Convention now to um, include provisions that address this particular problem. In other words, Status of other resources is unclear. Um, you should also know that you can do marine scientific research anywhere in this area without any problem. Have my other. Have, have you all been able to hear me all this time? 
<laughs> something has just happened to this machine. Yes? I'm looking at my sound man. All right. OK. So um, I really do need to do the right button. OK, here we are. Now, this gives you, um, again, a little summary of what um, I have just been saying. The major uh, point you want to take from this slide is that we have an authority that is set up to deal with this. You also need to know that, bless its heart, it is tiny. It is absolutely over, overwhelmed with work. And it has, um, in particular, a legal and technical committee, which does an enormous amount of the uh, actual substantive heavy lifting on the legal and technical side. Only 25 scientists and lawyers. And they have a, a huge, an absolutely huge job. What you need to be aware of as well is that um, the exploration regulations, they're all done. We are now working as an international community on the exploitation regulations. And there the ISA, because it represents, it is the trustee for the common heritage of mankind, has done something which other UN agencies um, could also very usefully take um, on board as an approach. Exploit, because they're a trustee for the common heritage and these nodules and sulfides and crusts, their proceeds need to go to help the common heritage. Well, the ISA decided it was going to consult mankind on how to exploit these um, uh, resources, and so they have opened up the development of the exploitation regulations to intensive consultations with the world. And this is very, very innovative and um, very much to be encouraged. Now, where we have a very interesting development as well is with the entry into this situation within the last five years of private companies into the mining area. Before, it was all just countries. And these were countries, research organizations, and they were all very happily exploring. But these private companies, they've got shareholder skin in the game. And as you all know, doing research at sea is horrendously expensive. And you have to do a very, very large amount of preliminary research in order even to be able to um, get an exploitation license. You have to explore under very complicated and extensive criteria and requirements set by the International Seabed Authority. This costs millions. So what you want to be aware of is that the private companies are unlikely to um, be able to keep their shareholders at bay for more than about five years with this money that is going out. And there is a very good chance that, therefore, we will see the mining of clarion Clifferton zone nodules within the next five years. Just to give you a, um, a uh, concept also of where we are since we're all here in the EU, at least still for another year. Um, EU member states, they are heavily implicated in, uh, in all of this. And to give you, and the EU is very heavily involved now in, these, uh, in this work. Um, just to give you a feel for what the poor ISA is dealing with in every single ocean, and we're looking at at least um, 26 contracts, and I have the feeling there's a 27th one that has, just been, uh, that has just been arranged. And all of this has to be dealt with. These are all exploration contracts by the ISA with that tiny staff and the 25 members of the uh, LTC. Four, remember, these three different resources over these gigantic areas of ocean in all these different environmental circumstances. So here we have the current licensing situation. I thought you would be interested in the breakdown of who the private companies are. Um, I've already mentioned, I've already mentioned Keppel. Um, we in the UK, we have our very own uh, seabed uh, research going on as well in uh, the Clarion Clipperton zone. Um, the uh, the Belgians have huge their uh, 
dredging technology as an inspiration. Deme is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, Belgian dredging company. So here you have, um, and also Nautilus has two different, has two different concessions in, uh, with different hats on in the uh, CCZ, but using their expertise as well in this context with, uh, with nodules. Now, what you do need to know also is that, as you can see here, none of the big majors, the terrestrial miners, they have no skin in the game except a little bit of Anglo-American. They're watching. This is really, this is, this is, it'll be really interesting to see at what point they are going to become involved and if so, how. You should also know that we don't have really yet, other than from Nautilus and an early one in which I was involved back in the Cretaceous on manganese nodules and crusts, um, we don't have any environmental impact statements yet. We only have these two as, uh, as examples. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on putting those together in a, in a proper way. Now, um, this is just to give you an idea and this is of what the ISA is actually asking in terms of its environmental impact assessment of all of these contractors. And remember again, the major burden on this is with the private companies who need to respond to shareholders. All the other company, uh, countries need to respond to their taxpayers and that's a different um, pressure, shall we say. So um, not only that, so you can see you have to not only be able to if you're in the ISA, take all of this individual information from all these various um, areas together, but you then need to figure out how to measure the cumulative impacts of all of this. So this is, again, for any kind of environmental management in the deep sea, for any other industry, the concept of managing regional cumulative impacts is something for which we have no experience and which we um, are going to be learning how to do this in in particular, the clarion clipperton zone. This is the sort of data that's required. And um, bear in mind that <clears throat> most of the data that is being gathered, that's another area that is of some commercial interest. Um, all the environmental data and the definition of what is environmental is not clear. And we do have a problem when you have environmental data that could actually um, result in more information about the resource. This is not yet defined. However, it's really only proprietary equipment design data that can remain confidential. So again, if you're a shareholder, if you're a company, you're looking at most of these data being made available within four years. Collaborative research is an area that is, again, under discussion, has to probably go in that direction. You cannot, if you're a company, do all of this all on your own. And this is being explored more and more um, more and more uh, in detail. In fact, um, Germany has uh, just engaged in exactly that type of exercise earlier this year in the clarion Clipperton zone. This just gives you an idea of the types of papers that the ISA has put out and the um, variety of areas that it is looking at. These are not just requirements. These are workshops. These are environmental management plans. These are scientific research papers, all of which is um, quite amazing that this is being produced and stimulated by such a tiny little UN agency. So nodules, in summary, do the initial heavy lifting is what I want you to um, come away with. Don't worry too much about sulfides and crusts. Keep an eye on what is going on in the clarion Clipperton zone for nodules they will pretty much inform what um, will be going on with the other two uh, areas. And they will also very much inform what um, other industries that are starting to look at the work in the deep sea and also what the um, uh, area beyond national jurisdiction uh, consultative process on the amendment of the uh, Law of the Sea Convention in New York will be looking at as well. Just to refresh your memory on what we're dealing with here, this is what we're looking at. Upwards of 20 countries, upwards of 20 contractors, 16 countries, and this level of complexity. And remember, this is just in this part of the Pacific. 
I just want to have a very quick overview of the International Marine Mining NGO. Civil society plays a very important role in this. The general environmental NGOs, of which I know I can see without my glasses, at least one of them is here. Um, the, uh, the point I want you to take away from this and the next slide is that there is only one learned professional society that actually deals with this subject exclusively. There are a lot of others that deal with it tangentially or through special interest groups, but there's only one that actually only does this. And um, as Judith was saying earlier, there have been a lot of false dawns with marine mining. Um, some of us have hung in there since 1970, hoping that this would happen before we died. And it looks like it might actually do so. Um, the next meeting, if you want to uh, uh, have, uh, have a flavor for the really the state of the art in marine mining is in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, at the beginning of next month. What the, um, what the International Marine Mineral Society has done that is actually very useful is put together an environmental management code for marine mining. It is non-binding, it is the only one so far that looks at the entire environmental side of this activity from cradle to grave, as it were. So um, the, uh, the other societies that um, do look at marine mining in various uh, capacities are here. And um, they all have meetings as well. They all usually have little mining sections. And they are all to be also looked at their websites and their meetings to check when they have, uh, when they have mining under discussion, because the people that contribute to these are very, very good and make excellent interventions. Now, um, finally, there are also groups of scientists that are concerned that the research is being done um, in an environmentally sustainable way. And uh, these are the three principal ones that um, I have been able to find and that I've been involved with as well in various capacities. And the European Union, as I told you earlier, it is looking at uh, supporting a lot of the technological side of this. And the, our... Um, the more policy-oriented one is the one at the bottom here. The, it's an environmental policy and uh, development group. It is in the latter half of a 36-month project. And I am on the advisory board of, uh, of this one. So here are my conclusions. We can do this, and we can do this right. But we definitely need all the stakeholders to get involved early and to stay involved throughout. The law of the sea provisions are completely and totally essential and vital to this. So the law of the sea work that is going on in New York also needs to be watched very, very carefully to make sure that it is um, developed in a consistent way with what is going on now. And what we really do also need, however, is for all of these requirements to be translated into effective national legislation and enforced. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you.